Welcome to Unpacking Peanuts, the podcast where three cartoonists take an in-depth look at the greatest comic strip of all time, Peanuts by Charles M. Schultz. Hey everybody, welcome back to the show. It's Unpacking Peanuts. We have a little uh, holiday treat for you today. A special remastered version of our Christmas episode where we discuss the legendary holiday classic, A Charlie Brown Christmas. Harold, uh, I know this is a a centerpiece of of your Peanuts love. Tell us about what we're about to uh, hear. Well, we went into the, the history of how we got to the special it's 15 years into Charles Schultz's run of the 50 year peanut strip. And there's a, a lot of history f- of Schultz dealing with a lot of these issues and, you know, adding scriptural references, which was unusual in, in comics at the time. And Schultz really, it was just a part of who he was. And I just gave a presentation actually on a Charlie Brown Christmas uh, a couple nights ago. And I was thinking about how, the culmination of all these things that Schultz was the even the outside comics that he was drawing for his, uh, his church denomination, which then were so popular that they were syndicated all over the world. And these other uh, denomination publications, people started to know him in a different way, even outside of peanuts. And then all of it just kind of comes to, to a head when he has the opportunity to make a Christmas special. And he's like, well, if I want to do a Christmas special, let's do it uh, about Christmas. So, I was marveling at at how all of these different pieces of his life kind of come together in this special. It's a, it's a classic for sure. One of my favorite things. I often say it's probably my favorite half hour of television. Michael, you still have not seen it. Nope. Seen bits and pieces. All right. So now sit back and enjoy this special remastered edition of a Charlie Brown Christmas. It was one of the most fun ones to record and I hope you guys have fun listening to it. So whatever you're celebrating, Make it be jolly and merry and happy and full of lightness and love. And we will see you real soon. Hey, everybody. Welcome to the show. It's Unpacking Peanuts. It's the podcast that is not only getting too commercial, it is getting too dangerous. We are so happy to have you here today because today we are discussing uh, the 30 or so strips that were adapted into the seminal and classic animated special, A Charlie Brown Christmas. Uh, now, don't worry uh, if you if you're not a, a Christmas enthusiast uh, or if you're the world's biggest enthusiast, it doesn't matter if you start celebrating in April or if you've never jingled a bell in your life. Uh, you are welcome here to talk about our favorite thing, Charles Schultz and his fantastic comic strip Peanuts. I hope you're having a good holidays, whichever holidays you celebrate. I'm Jimmy Gownley. I'm one of your hosts for this evening. Um, I'm the cartoonist of Amelia Rules, the dumbest idea ever and seven good reasons not to grow up. Joining me, as always, are my pals, co-hosts, and fellow cartoonists. He's a playwright and a composer, both for the band Complicated People, as well as for this very podcast. He's the co-creator of the original comic book Price Guide, the original editor for Amelia Rules, and the cartoonist behind such great creations as Strange Attractors, A Gathering of Spells, and Tangled River. It's Michael Cohen. Hey there. And he's the executive producer and writer of Mystery Science Theater 3000, a former vice president of Archie Comics, and the current creator of the Instagram strip Sweetest Beasts. It's Harold Buckholtz. Hello. Guys, I'm very happy to uh, be with you today uh, so we can talk about one of my favorite things, which is A Charlie Brown Christmas. I know for Harold and I, uh, it's it's one of our favorite, if our, not our very favorite episode of television ever. Michael has never seen it at all which is okay because he's the peanuts purist on this podcast. So what we're going to do, just like we did for the great pumpkin, our uh, super listener, Joshua Stauffer has compiled all of the strips, uh, which have been adapted into this animated special on our website. You'll be able to go there and download a PDF, which uh, Joshua has put together and you'll be able to see what the strips are and you'll be able to read along with us. It's a little trickier than uh, going with uh, gocomics.com and just going through because they're they're done in a variety of different orders. They're told out of sequence because they were just collaged to make this special. Uh, So before you listen to this, if you really want to get hardcore, go download that, then come back, and we'll go through the strips. But before we do that, I bet 
if there's one person in the world who would have a few things to say about the history and the making of a Charlie Brown Christmas, it's my pal, Harold Buckholtz. Harold, do you got any info for us? <laughs> yes, actually, I do. So I was thinking about this this special and, and that it's been running now for, what, 57? This would be the 58th yeah. year. Uh, and it's still part of the cultural <laughs> zeitgeist. Um, it's it's available if anybody is wanting to see it. It's not on the networks as it normally is. Apple got, bought the rights to all of the Peanuts stuff for their streaming service. But because they know it is such a part of the cultural landscape, what they've done is they've allowed people who do not pay for the Apple, was it, what's it called? Apple Plus or App, what's the name of the service that they yeah. do? They will allow you to actually see it for free. I think you may have to sign up to get in there, but they will let you specifically see the, the Peanuts specials, like the Thanksgiving special, and the Christmas special for free because they don't want to be the Grinch and and, <laughs> and, and and have a wall between people and this beloved show. So thank you to Apple for doing that. And if you do want to see it this year, that is a way to to do it. Yeah. So the, the background on this um, on this Christmas special, um, Lee Mendelson uh, was a, a, a producer, kind of a very entrepreneurial guy. He was in the San Francisco area and he met Schultz in 1963. He had just done a documentary on Willie Mays uh, called A Man Named Mays, which had aired and uh, Schultz had seen it. And it just hit Mendelssohn at, at one point. I've just done a documentary on the greatest baseball player of the time. Why don't I do a documentary on the worst baseball player of, of all time? And so that's what, <laughs> that's why he got in touch with Schultz because that, that idea just tickled his fancy. And so Schultz, I can't, I, like I said, had seen the, the Willie Mays documentary and, and really liked it. So he agreed to meet uh, about it. And at this point, the, the uh, Ford Falcon commercials, uh, which were on the Tennessee Ernie Ford show, as well as I guess, regular broadcast ads, had already run in 1962, and you can see them on YouTube if you want. And they're they're very interesting because it's the very first attempt at animation. And Bill Melendez, who had been a former Disney animator and and did a lot of uh, Warner Brothers animation, he was a top animator at uh, Warner Brothers on the Bugs Bunny and Daffy Duck cartoons. Um, he was the guy who was uh, brought in by this ad agency. He had to essentially audition for this kind of flat peanuts animation style and he said animators don't audition but he when he found out it was for peanuts he's like okay i get it you know this had never been translated and schultz's style was so two-dimensional they needed to get somebody who could actually make it work and so melendez had done these ford commercials and schultz liked him and schultz was a very loyal guy so you know he melendez had worked with him before so he recommended melendez to be the guy to animate uh, uh, maybe two minutes of stuff for this uh, boy named Charlie Brown documentary in 1963. And they actually made it and without a sponsor and without a network. And uh, to the surprise of, of uh, Lee Mendelssohn, nobody wanted to buy it. So it sat on a shelf for seven years before the fame of Schultz was so overwhelming that finally someone says, okay, yeah, let's, let's, let's air this special seven years later. But that was kind of the beginning of this little team that was floating there in the animation world for, for Charles Schultz. And apparently what happened was that there was a, an opportunity when the time magazine gave a front cover peanuts, uh, coverage, which was time magazine. If you got on the cover of time magazine, that seemed to be like that, that meant you have made it in, in American culture. And that happened in April of 1965. It's and like getting a whole bunch of likes on Instagram <laughs> all at once. Now I understand. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and so this guy from McCann Erickson, an ad agency, had just seen the, um, the documentary on Schultz that they had turned down to, to find a sponsor. But the guy kind of liked what he had seen and he saw the animation that had been done. And he, he just called up Lee Mendelson and said, how would you like to do a Christmas special? Cause Coca-Cola was looking for a Christmas special. And that's not a lot of lead time uh, for a half hour animated special. And, no. but he, he said, Hey, what, you know, what do you think about that? And, and Lee's like, sure, 
absolutely. And then he, he calls up um, Charles Schultz and says, I think I just sold a Charlie Brown Christmas show. And, uh, and he said, Schultz said, and what show might that be? <laughs> and Lendelson, the one you need to make an outline for tomorrow. <laughs> <laughs> so that was the beginning of it. And, and, and he said, Schultz said, okay, come on up. Cause um, they were so close to each other. Schultz is, you know, in the Santa Rosa, San Sebastopol area, just South of San Francisco. And this is where Lee Mendelson is based out of. It's, it's near San Francisco. So next day he, he visits Schultz and they just kind of sit down. And according to Mendelssohn, it was like Schultz said, okay, if it's going to be a Christmas special, I want to certainly deal with the true meaning of Christmas. And I'd like to do a lot of scenes with snow and with skating. So obviously his memories of Hennepin Very County yeah, was, yeah. was on his mind. And, he's, and basically Mendelssohn said it, it all tumbled out. And uh, I'm, I'm pulling a lot of this from an amazing book. If anybody's a Charlie Brown Christmas fan or is just interested in the history of this, check out A Charlie Brown Christmas, The Making of a Tradition by Lee Mendelssohn with reminiscences by Bill Melendez. It came out in 2000, right after Schultz had passed away. And you can kind of feel that, that freshness of loss of, of Schultz and celebration of Schultz. That, is that the square book with the silver cover? Yes, it's a beautiful. Yeah, okay. That's a great book, yeah. And and done by people that were in the middle of it. And there are things in there that you normally would not see in a book like this, unless I mean Melendez was still around. Obviously, uh, Mendelssohn was. So they they have like they have the entire I forget the term, but basically every single assignment for every single scene for every single animator. You can see who was assigned wow. what in this two page spread. There's lots of cool stuff like that in there, and the and the reminiscences are very fresh from a lot of people uh, in 2000 and he dedicated it in uh, the book it says for Sparky will never forget you. So it's a, it's a great book. So anyway, the, what happens <laughs> is in this conversation where he's just hanging out with Schultz and trying to figure what it's all about. He says it all tumbled out and they wound up pretty much having the idea for what this was going to be instantly. And of course Schultz says, well, get in touch with Bill Melendez again. He's our guy. And so he calls up Bill Melendez and says, can you do a Christmas special in, in eight months, which really wound up being six months. And just like uh, Mendelssohn, Melendez was like, sure. <laughs> but <laughs> yeah, <laughs> of course it could be done. And, of but it is really, really tight to do something like this. And it helps, I think, that you know he had the background animating Schultz before. He'd already worked with them. So they didn't have to figure out certain things that, you know, they would have had to figure out otherwise. So that helped. And then they brought in all of the children because they were going to do children's voices, which was pretty unheard of to have children doing children. Yeah, that's one of the big keys to, I think, what makes it peanutsy, which it, which is a brilliant, I think, maneuver by Schultz, because one of the big like hooks, I think, especially at the time was oh, it's little kids talking like adults. And even though we didn't, we, we've established that's not exactly what it is. I think to the general populace, it probably was. So can you talk a little bit about that? Like whose decision? I'm sure that was Schultz's decision. But was there ever thought of going with, uh, you know, professional adult actors? I think Schultz specifically said he did not like that. He did not like the sound of, of adults right. pretending to be children. And so that was something he he did insist on because that was kind of his own pet fee that he didn't want that in there. And. And I think Melendez was game to do it. He'd already done it. I think he'd done it with the children, child's voice, uh, you know, back with the Ford Falcon thing. So again, it was something they were kind of familiar with. And uh, Peter Robbins uh, was the first Charlie Brown. And um, he said, he said he was mystified by a lot of the dialogue. Uh, and it <laughs> seemed edgy to him as a kid because, the, you know, they're talking about, you know, it's all run by a great e you know, an Eastern syndicate, you know, and stuff like that. Where they, they didn't understand what they were saying. And the girl that played uh, that uh, little Sally was six years old. She couldn't read yet. And so they would feed her a line or half of a line at a time. And you, you hear that in the special where she's saying things like, all I want is what's coming to me. <laughs> yeah. All I want is my fair share. And it's, it's just so <laughs> endearing. This little, it's like a little kid just trying to spit these words out that do sound like a couple of layers too uh, complex for her. <laughs> it's, it's really special and, and unique. And the idea that they, 
they kind of struggle a little bit with their own lines. Uh, that's pretty amazing. I mean, even the the kid who played Linus, I think he was he maybe just turned seven. Wow. And he had done some voice work before, and and they said, you know, he's kind of a, a perfect a perfect voice for Linus because you know how do you embody these characters that people have gotten to know so well, and everyone's got their own voice in their own head as they're reading. Yeah. They, and that's a really interesting question. Like, do you really have a voice in your head so that when Linus speaks, it's like, that's not Linus. I think that's probably true. It's like, like when the, when, um, when Garfield first came out, I think people right. were like a little shocked at his voice because they thought they knew what it was, but they knew what it wasn't, you know, and somehow they seem to nail it with the peanuts characters in a way that is is pretty remarkable. Well, uh, I mean, but is that true? Do you hear a voice of the character in your head or do you hear like your own internal reading voice? Like whatever that voice is. Yeah, I don't think I'm I'm um, in a, an audio or oral for myself. I mean, listening to something, I don't think I'm as, as specific as some people are. I think some people right. might be more specific in their own minds than, than say I am, but Right. You know, Christopher Shea was Linus and, you know, they, when they were looking, there was uh, the casting person said, well, I, I have this kid who has a slight lisp and, and he, he, he <laughs> can read with great emotion. And they were like, oh, we found our Linus. This, this is a great kid. But even then, you know, he's, he's barely old enough to read some of this. So they're having to feed him a bunch of this, a, a bunch of these lines. So anyway, it's, it's just a, a really interesting thing. And then for the, for the the uh, hark the herald angels sing they go and find i think at the saint paul's episcopal church in san rafael they basically just had a bunch of kids who were in the choir who volunteered didn't even know what they were signing up for it's just well you want to support the church you <laughs> show up at wow. 7 p.m and they bust them over and they for a few nights they they sing they sing uh, christmas carols and that's you know and they had no idea really what this was all about until they uh until the the special came out and they were like oh you know which which version did they use of the songs that we sang so mendelssohn that this was this was just a grueling session according to the charlie brown voice actor uh he said that it was i think three hours was was all the kids were together it was chaos (laughs) and and they (laughs) but they recorded pretty much the whole thing in three hours with all the everybody all together, including uh, Men, uh, Melendez, who would do the voice of Snoopy sped up or not right. voice, but, you know, the sounds of Snoopy, which must have been also a tough choice. Right. Because Snoopy is a th- think, you know, he thinks we see him think all the time. And then what do you do in animation? Do you let him have the echoey voice of the, you know, John didn't ask for a second cup of coffee? Right? I mean, to <laughs> me, that is such the obvious choice to go have snoopy he could even be an adult voice right have it all be in his head and you'll be able to get that snoopy voice Mm -hmm. that you have in the strip but boy thank god they didn't do that (laughs) it would totally change the animated specials and and change the the balance of the specials yeah you know but you're right i mean i I, and i I guessing that must have been schultz insisting and, and, and melendez apparently was quite happy with the idea of hey let's just let him be like a harpo marx kind of character yeah Uh, but it it does change probably more than anything i think that changes the nature of this of the strip versus the animated specials and the fact that snoop we do not know snoopy's thoughts verbally yeah very very much it's and and i never even thought about it but if you were a person who just read the or just uh watched the specials you do have a very different conception of snoopy yeah and, and i was just i was just thinking and i uh, trying to do a little bit of math and I, I would estimate that the number of viewings of this specific special is probably somewhere in the neighborhood of 1 billion amazing and i was and i'm trying to think what other film or television things have been seen 1 billion times particularly with something that is has like a storyline in it now, maybe music videos collectively people well, see it over and over. Well, music videos are different. Thing. Yeah, you know, Gangnam Style videos. has been seen well over a billion times, right? <laughs> and that's three minutes. That's a different commitment. Yeah, commitment. It, it's right. It's really. it's not narrative. And I think okay, Rudolph is probably up there. The Grinch is probably up there. But like you know, the biggest it's a soup. Wonderful life. It's a Wonderful Life. Maybe getting close to that. But you try to think of what's lasted long enough to cumulatively around the world have that 
level of, of viewership and common experience. I would guess it's it's up there in the top 10 of anything that's ever been made. I mean, you, you got Wizard of Oz, you know, you, you, you're Gone with the Wind. I mean, even those, I think it beats out. I'm sure, and it's, yeah. you know, like when a movie's in a movie, movie theaters, uh, you know, the biggest movie is going to be seen by maybe, at, I mean, Gone with the Wind probably had... F- 25 million 30 million people see it at first just like a a tv show (laughs) right it's crazy well you know the other thing about it is charlie brown christmas only airs at christmas i mean you can sort of like lots of like gone with the wind you know back it it, it aired once a year but you watch it anytime yeah i think like reruns of racism yeah (laughs) (laughs) and and reruns of um andy griffith's show are probably in the hundreds of millions because that show just never died and ran on all these different countries. Luke, the Flint, Flintstones has been all over the world. So, you know, the this thing- is a, this is our new podcast where we just name TV shows. <laughs> the <laughs> the <Hooray>. Jeffersons. <laughs> In the Carlton, your doorman animated special, I'm sure is up there too. From a classic. Rhoda. But, By the way, that's our second Carlton, your doorman reference on this podcast. <laughs> that's how hip we are. We are with it. Anything newer than 50 years is a shock to our listeners. <laughs> so, so, so basically these guys are going flat out trying to make this thing. Uh, they don't have a whole lot of time to second guess, shoot something over again, redo a scene. They just have to stick with schultz's storyboard uh ideas and and they just have to go for it and i think you see that in the special i think that's why in some ways it's so raw and so true to schultz is because in some ways they didn't have any time to try to take it beyond the strip and then that kind of set set the mold going forward of how this was going to be and mendelson was saying the show was finished a week before the broadcast date i bet uh, and they said they were all exhausted. And for the first time, the staff watched the entire show. It said, we we all felt our uneasiness after the screening. We thought that perhaps we had somehow missed the boat. It says, however, one of the animators, Ed Levitt, stood up in the back row and declared, a Charlie Brown Christmas will run for a hundred years. <laughs> and he said, most of us would have been happy for two. <laughs> <laughs> So then Mendelssohn flies this prince with this prince to New York City, and he presents it to these two CBS executives, nervous as can be. And he quotes them saying, well, you gave it a good shot. It seems a little flat, a little slow. We will, of course, air it next week, but I'm afraid we won't be ordering anymore. We're sorry. And believe me, we're big Peanuts fans. Uh, yes, believe me, believe me. There's <laughs> no one who loves you more. Well, than us. isn't that turning the knife even more? We were rooting right. for this more than anything, and and even right. with that extra push, you failed. Right. Right. Exactly, and with their unerring sense of incorrectness, <laughs> they confidently predict they will not be making any more. I love it. Yeah, we're saying maybe it's just better suited to the comics page. Now, I I get that because they're seeing something for the first time and it is unlike other animation. It's not as slick. And they lack any it's slow. soul and or creative <laughs> bone in their body and therefore are afraid to say they like it because it's different. Right. It is. It's an artistic statement it, that will make any guy in a suit mad, upset, nervous. Well, yeah. <laughs> holding on to their you're... wallet. <laughs> Yeah, well, what are they going to peg it against? And and this right. thing was standing alone, and it wasn't what they expected. And anyway, so the story goes: Mendelssohn heard them talk to each other, and they said, "What should we do with Bergheim?" And Mendelssohn's like, oh, and then the, the other guy says, "We shouldn't show it to him." It's like, who's Bergheim? And it turned out he was a uh, uh, the TV reviewer for Time Magazine. He was waiting outside to review it to hit his deadline. And Mendelssohn was like, well, wouldn't it be worse if you don't show it to him? So they said, all right, yeah, you can see it. And so he had to sit through a second screening with Bergheim silently watching this thing. The guy gets up, thanks him and leaves. (laughs) And Mendelssohn's like, oh, (laughs) he's just devastated because nobody, nobody is responding to this thing uh, except Ed Levitt in that, that room. And so 
he he said he flew home to San Francisco and the airport was like the first place to get the early copy of Time magazine. And so when he, you know, when he got there, it was just being loaded on there. And he said, I was shaking when I opened it up and got a lovely review from, from Time magazine. And so I was like, well, maybe we've got a shot. There you go. So it airs on December 9th, 1965. It gets a 45% share which basically means 45 percent of all television sets that were tuned in watched this show it was the number two show only to bonanza which was a blockbuster at the time western and it, as as one uh as one ad exec was quoted as saying i think in david mccallis's book all heaven broke loose <laughs> people just like oh this is amazing that just the the warmth and everyone all of a sudden just instantly embraced this this special and it goes on to win uh, uh, the Peabody Award for Outstanding uh, Children's Program. It wins the Emmy Award for Outstanding uh, Animated Special. Yeah, so probably over 40 million people saw it the very first time it airs. And then it goes on to, I, I think that the peak was 1969, which kind of gives you some Peanuts barometer of where Peanuts was in the culture. The 1969 is the peak year uh, of the Christmas special where uh, it had a, a 53 share, and I'm guessing in that case, probably 50 million people watched it. And that's that's in the top 10 Christmas specials of all time. So it was 1967. So, um, And usually those are like the Bob Hope Christmas specials were the ones that everybody was watching. But for animated specials, it's the highest rated animated Christmas special ever for the top two slots. So and, and, well and maybe more. Yeah. Well deserved. It is an absolute masterpiece. And you know what else uh, was a masterpiece? That bit of research from you, Mr. Harold Buckholz. Thank you so much. Uh, I feel like I just got a Christmas present from you uh, hearing all that. That was wonderful. Oh, well, thank you. So listen, how about this? We're going to take a quick break now. And when we come back, we're going to talk about why Michael's never seen it. And late breaking news, Liz saw the premiere. So we're going to discuss Ooh. that. So meet us on the other side of this. Hi, everyone. It's the holiday season, and Unpacking Peanuts has gift ideas for everyone on your list. Jimmy, Michael, and Harold all have books for sale. You can find links to buy them on our website. You can also purchase exclusive Unpacking Peanuts t-shirts. If you're feeling especially generous and love the podcast, we invite you to support us on Patreon or buy us a mud pie. Warm greetings of the season from all of us at Unpacking Peanuts. And now back to the show. And we're back. Michael, you have never seen a Charlie Brown Christmas. Is that correct? It is true. And also, I have never seen any of the Peanuts specials. All right, explain yourself. Okay. Well, it's it's a complicated story. Um, you're talking 1965. <laughs> so I would have been 15. Right. And... At 15, I would have had no say in what we were watching on TV. It would have been a family decision. Right. And since my family did not celebrate Christmas, and since Bonanza was on, I can pretty <laughs> much guarantee we are watching Bonanza. <laughs> Anyway, uh, the fact that I haven't seen any of the animated specials uh, kind of nullifies that excuse. The fact is that I am very much a purist on reading the comic strips. That's the form I grew up with. That's the form I loved. A uh, big influence on my life. But I remember when I saw the first commercials, it bothered me and started seeing ads. and. It was sort of a feeling like, okay, selling out, not a good thing. But also, I, it was a little jarring to see them animated, and I didn't like it. Right. And I, I'm i sure I knew the specials were on, but I, I had no interest in watching the specials. Well, you have a unique perspective that almost nobody has, which yeah. you, it, which you bring to this podcast, that you are all about the strips. And that is what informs you about peanuts. You don't have all this extra stuff in the back of your head that other people do when it comes to the strip. Right. Well, I right. I'd never had any interest in the toys or even the books. It was just pure strips and collections of the strips. 
And I know a lot of our, our listeners are probably fans of collecting the toys. And, I, you know, I think that's great, but I didn't want anything that was not pure Schultz peanuts. You know, so certainly over the years, I, I've, I've caught little bits and pieces of the specials, and I really don't like the voices. Oh, wow. I, I I hear you when you're saying, you know, you, it was charming that it was little kids, but it was, they were also not actors. And it's a very subtle strip with very, very careful dialogue. And something was missing. It Even though I, I didn't, I don't think I actually heard what their voices were in my head, but it, it was not kids. Hmm. And it was you know, well-delivered lines. Right. You know, the, the, these, these strips are are just carefully paced. And so you you can hear that what the characters or the words are saying, but you can also hear their tone. And when that's not there, it's, it's very flat. And like you're describing, the kids were being prompted Mm -hmm. or they didn't know what the words meant. So you're not going to get, the best reading or even a good reading. So anyway, I'm, I'm perfectly happy not to have seen them. And uh, I don't think I will ever see them, which is fine. I don't want anything corrupting. Well, uh, yeah. And I will, I just want to say, I'm sorry. What was that? No, I, I just don't want, I have this, this very pure, you know, right. pure experience with peanuts and not my uh, model modulate in any way by any outside influences and i not only would i consider it a failure for this podcast if uh michael had to watch the animated specials i i would consider it a failure of my friendship <laughs> with michael if he had to watch the, the specials and because it is a totally different perspective it is one i totally respect and you know it's one that i might have shared mm-hmm. if i was michael's age right because I, when i watched peanuts just appeared and the show was shows were already a years old by the time I was watching them. You know, there was no thought of what would Peanuts be like animated. There's a very good chance I saw animated versions of Peanuts from the time I was an infant, you know, just in my line of sight or whatever. So, so yeah, so I am very happy uh, that we have three such uh, different <laughs> and, you know, Venn diagram like uh, takes on, on Peanuts and, I can't wait. And like I said at the top of the show, whether you're a Christmas fan or not, stick with us. We are going to go through these strips now and um, we'll just enjoy them like we always do, because this is this is Schultz and Peanuts at the absolute top of his game. Want to go through the strips? Sure. Sure. Lights, please. All right. So we are going to just uh, jump here into the strips. And remember, these are all the strips that Schultz chose and Mendelssohn chose to adapt into this uh, this classic special. A Charlie Brown Christmas, and they're not all Christmas strips. They're all over the place. So here we go. This is July 1st, 1959. Charlie Brown is standing outside, looking very contemplative. Linus, with thumb and blanket in classic position, looks on. Charlie Brown says, I thought having a baby sister would change my whole life, but it hasn't. Charlie Brown leans up on, it's like an old rustic fence, uh, replacing the thinking wall. And he says, People still hate me. Nobody really likes me. I get just as depressed as I always did. Then he walks away from Linus, looking completely forlorn. Linus, worried, looks after him and says, Poor Charlie Brown. Then Linus, in classic thumb and blanket pose, says, Of all the Charlie Browns in the world, he's the Charlie Brownest. Now, I wonder if Schultz had that punchline and was just waiting for the right strip. (laughs) It's because it's such a classic punchline. Yeah. Yeah, which came first? That's really interesting. I I wouldn't know which way that happened. It would be tough to guess if he he set himself up and came up with an amazing end line, or if he had that end line, like Michael said, and he, he found the great setup for it. But I do think it's improved in the animated special where it's Charlie Browniest. Yes, <laughs> of all the Charlie Browns in the world, you're the Charlie Browniest. Is uh, that's how I read? I read it. I read it that way. I remember it as one. Browniest. I don't, you know. That's interesting. Oh, yeah? <laughs> yeah. That is interesting. You know, one of the wild things is just that, like, so much of this is a collage. The whole special is a collage. He's taking all of these strips, 
moving them around, switching characters yeah. up. And if you download Joshua Stauffer's PDF on our website, unpackingpeanuts.com, he does his own little take on the differences and, and, and stuff between the strips and the adaptation. But boy, and the whole thing is a collage. It's these old strips. It's a Bible verse. It's uh, it's Vince Guaraldi's music, which we haven't mentioned, but which is iconic yeah. and, and everyone in the world knows. It's And I wonder how did, he must have known that's such a great punchline and thought, great and i can fix it i can add that eye that michael's been hearing all these years anyway yeah what a way to open the thing that, that shows you how strong he f- strongly he felt about that strip and that statement absolutely february 14th 1963 it's valentine's day in the foreground Shermy and violet are exchanging valentines charlie brown looks on from the background he says rats nobody ever gives me any valentines Then he walks off, looking upset, saying, I wish there wasn't such a thing as Valentine's Day. I know nobody likes me. Then in the last panel, he shouts to the heavens, Why do we have to have a Valentine's Day to emphasize it? Now, this is changed in the uh, animated special to be, Why do we have to have a holiday season? Oh, okay. It's uh, just brought something to mind. I guess there's probably some play in the early 70s. I thought... Huh, I wonder if I could do a, a daily strip. I will try to write one. With like my like me, hmm. a cartoon me is the main character. <laughs> I stole the punchline. <laughs> I didn't consciously do it. Now I realize <laughs> my this was my strip. Oh. We well, yeah, well welcome to the club. How many times have I done that? And then I see then I read peanuts for this podcast, like, oh <laughs> that wasn't mine. Oh, I, I'm fairly I'm fairly certain I stole one for, I think I mentioned in one of the early episodes for a commercial gig I do on a monthly basis. And I'm, I, we haven't come up in it to it in the strips yet, but I, I, I know it's coming and I'll be like, ouch. <laughs> They're just baked in when you've read them yeah. thousands of times. What do you think? I think it's better having this on Valentine's day than Christmas. What I like about the, the Christmas special version of it is it's so low key in the Christmas special. And you'd think in an animated thing, it would be the over to- over the top yelling like we have in the, in the comic strip, but it's, it's the reverse. He's saying it in this very yeah. low key way, which really kind of knifes you in the heart, the way he says it. And I think it was the right choice because the animation, I think can exaggerate things so much that you can almost lose what you're trying to say um, that it's, that right. it's done in this. It's not a, not a whisper, but it's very quiet. It's a scream in my head voice. He's yelling on that last panel. Oh yeah, yeah, absolutely. And but not in the in the special. It's it's very much <laughs> it's very much him saying it almost in a resigned way, which is is, you know, it's it's, it's it really gets you. January 6th, 1955. Patty and Charlie Brown are standing outside in the snow. Charlie Brown says, "Come on and see the snowman Pigpen made." Patty says to Charlie Brown, Say, I'll bet playing around in the snow kept him clean, didn't it? They both walk off towards Pigpen with Charlie Brown saying, on the contrary. And then Charlie Brown presents Pigpen's snowman and says, the world's dirtiest snowman. With a big smile on on Pigpen's face of pride. Yes, and the snowman's face and Charlie Brown's. (laughs) They're all happy about it, except for for Patty. She's a little uncertain, it looks like. Uh, Michael just found a really interesting article about Pigpen and what was it, Astra Magazine? Yeah, it's a web magazine. I've never heard of it. Uh, I saw a link to it. And uh, I don't want to comment on it too much. It's it's definitely worth reading. But I I would have considered Pigpen like a one-joke character. And a very perceptive writer goes on for pages on the depths of Pigpen and how how complex a character he is. So read that because I've never seen that. And I now I can appreciate Pigpen some more. <laughs> it's cra- I mean, that, you know, that is a sign of a great work of art that the more you look at it uh, and the more you go into it with, you know, an open ar- a mind and open eyes, uh, you do see stuff. You do see stuff that you never thought about before. And, you know, it, apparently, and even according to that article, Schultz himself thought, pig pen was a one joke idea uh and actually wrote him out of the strip for nine years which i've read this thing all the way through twice and uh never noticed didn't miss him was gone for like (laughs) nine years wow never even thought about it and it's not that i don't like which decade was he not around 
Oh, uh, I think I think what I don't I you know it, it's like the late sixties to the end of the seventies okay. or something like that. Wow. I'm pretty sure, or it might be it's seventies into the eighties. Read the article; uh, they have the right dates, but it's really interesting. Yeah, and it, it's interesting for those who have seen the Christmas special. I think there's something about the special that really cements him in the Peanuts pantheon because he comes across as a as as very self confident and proud but in a he has this kind of high self-esteem that somehow is comes across as pretty endearing and that i think that at least in my mind that is pig pen um, probably because of having seen the christmas special so many times that i look at him through the lens of the special i, I will i'll admit because of how he comes across as just it's just if anybody gives him any trouble he's got the comeback <laughs> for uh, for their uh, for their insults or their criticisms. We're not going to read this one, but uh, May thirty first, nineteen fifty seven, uh, is another strip that was adapted where Charlie Brown says, uh, "Pigpen, you're the only person I know who can raise a cloud of dust in a snowstorm." So that also Pigpen gets another gag there in the special. December third, nineteen fifty five, Linus and Lucy are standing out in the snow, and it's flurrying. Lucy says, try to catch the snowflakes on your tongue, Linus. The second panel has them both standing there trying to do just that. Then in panel three, Linus seems to be chowing down on some snowflakes. Hmm, smack, smack. Then he looks to Lucy and says, need sugar. (laughs) Um, So were you guys ever, well, Michael, you weren't a snowflake catcher. I did not know what snow was. You didn't have snow. Nope. (laughs) (laughs) When was the first time you saw snow, Michael? Well, I grew up in New York till I was four and a half, so I I just didn't remember it till four and a half. Okay, yeah, I love I love the little the, the thin little tongue on Lucy on the second panel. It makes me think of a a dog's tongue rather than a child's tongue. I'm never a hundred percent when he sticks the tongues out. They always look a little creepy to me. For some <laughs> well, <laughs> like like lizard like or something. How about when they uh, when they they're they're writing and they've got the tongue up in the corner? That's okay. I can tolerate that. It's the profile tongue. <laughs> uh, how about when they're aware of their tongue? <laughs> no! Don't say it. Now we're doomed. I can't even talk now. <laughs> January 5th, 1960. January 5th, 1960. Lucy and Linus are out doing the snow catching on your tongue bit again five years later. Uh, Linus says, catch the snowflakes on your tongue, Lucy. Then Lucy, very professorially, says, it's too early. I never eat January snowflakes. I always wait until February. In panel three, she walks away, leaving Linus alone to comment in panel four. They sure look ripe to me. (laughs) That's a wild thing to think he had a 1955 strip and a 1960 strip. Uh, you know what? There's like 1,500 comic strips between them or whatever, more. But he puts them together in this show as if they're like seconds apart. Mm-hmm. I, I wonder how this, like, do, do you think he just like sat down with a bunch of books and like went through look, just circling gags or yeah, I'm wondering, tearing pages? I'm wondering what kind of access he had to his former strips, you know, did, I mean, because right. obviously not all of them had been reprinted and then they got mixed up. So for a Christmas special, you know, you would think, let's go back and look around November through February and see what we got. But I bet he had a clay clipped. I bet he clipped them out and put them in a notebook. He'd have to do that. Yes. Yeah, so somebody. Yeah. Right. <laughs> like, like, like his Conley. or his secretary. Yeah. Would have like, like have, have this, these, yeah, these, these tear sheets or something from the syndicate a row, a that they could just flip through. Yeah. He must have. Right. Yeah. Cause he has to get all the backgrounds that the, the tree has to look exactly the same every time. Right? <laughs> all right you know i was just gonna say this and i if this if this came to me and they said hey jimmy you're gonna do a christmas special and you're gonna have to just pick the best stuff from amelia from like 1300 pages of it mm-hmm. i would feel in a weird way almost constricted by it really you did it and, and he yeah like you did it for oh, a christmas musical no but that was adapted well, we did do a Christmas musical, which right, Michael wrote, but that's different. I didn't write it. You you picked the story. the bit you wanted in there from from Amelia, but it was all from one issue. Is my point? My yeah, point is true, I didn't true. really take stuff from all over it, and I didn't take stuff like I didn't take a Rhonda line and give it to Tanner, uh-huh. or I didn't. You know, that I would feel 
weird about doing, I think, and I, which is the wrong move. I mean, he was so smart to go. I have the, a gold mine of the greatest comic material ever, and I'm going to use it as a raw material to make this other art again, like a collage. Well, it's so episodic. You you have to, right? I mean, he at this point he doesn't have a ton of of arcs. He has a few uh, for Christmas, so he's he's got to pull something uh, kind of out of the hat here. And it, and and this is the thing about the these animated specials is they are extremely episodic like the strip and i think to some people that's maybe jarring because you know that no other animation is is done this way where you have the setup for a joke and the characters are in a certain location and sometimes it's almost like they'll just like fade out fade back into the same the same setting where people are now in a slightly different position and then you do the next gag it, you know that's that was always kind of a piece of of what these shows were about is like Bill Melendez wanted to mess with Schultz's original vision so little that you would get these, these little smatterings of, of basically a four panel joke that's going to run maybe 15 seconds. And then there's going to be another one with, you know, with Peppermint Patty and Marcy that's are in the same room, but the setting has changed just like the strips change. And it's a really interesting choice. And it makes these these specials different, than I think, any other any other animation I've ever seen. Well, one of the things, though, I think that makes particularly this one and to a lesser extent, some of the early ones shine a little bit more, maybe, is that Schultz isn't super precious about it. Right. right. Like I said, like, you know, he will take a character's. Uh, you know, and, and switch the lines of dialogue, uh, whatever he needs to do to make it work. A whole setting we'll see later uh, is a a play rehearsal in the show, but it's a baseball meeting in the strip. Yeah. And later when I think when Schultz gets less involved and then sadly, you know, after he passes away, it becomes where they are just adapting strips almost directly up until the movie where, you know, it's his son and someone else who, co- who writes the script. And suddenly then they they, it feels like they have that freedom again to mix and match and, and, and do some, some, interesting stuff i can say that i think probably why this one is is that way and it's so it's so collaged is prop like it probably was the most um you know them all sitting in a room probably looking through things and collecting information as they go yeah i think that's how it was done this first time around because they were all trying to figure it out together and they needed each other for support and insight but later the way bill melendez described how these things were done Schultz would would create an outline independently of Melendez or, or or Mendelssohn for the most part. He would send that to Melendez. Melendez would then take it and storyboard it out. And obviously Schultz, probably his secretary, had collected the strips. And so basically he, he's getting not Schultz thinking this through bit by bit and how it all put pieces together, but he's just getting this outline. They'd make a storyboard for it. They send it back to Schultz. And change, and so Schultz basically changes it and rewrites it uh, off of the storyboard they create, and then he he sees Schultz two times after the outline in person, and then it's like two two hour meetings, and then that's it. And then Schultz is like, "Okay, you're the animator, you you make it happen." And so it it is a very formalized process, like so much uh, limited animation was done, like in the Saturday morning. It was like you'd have somebody who was not an, an artist write a scooby-doo script or whatever and then they would send that to hannah barbera and then somebody who never met the writer would storyboard this out and lay it out as best they could and so you know you wouldn't get visual gags or whatever because the writers it's all words there's there's no visuals to help write the story and so it's kind of this weird hybrid with what schultz is doing he's actually sending them finished things in comic strip form that they have to translate and because it's done, you know, I think in, in that kind of, it's not assembly line process, but it's a back and forth that, that the strips, yeah, I think after you do the special a couple of times when they're working together, then it's just, I'm off in my corner doing this, hand it to, off to you, you do it in your corner, and there's, there's not that collaboration. June 23rd, 1958. Linus is annoyed, but in classic thumb and blanket position. Behind him, Lucy is hectoring him. You and that dumb blanket, you'll be dragging that thing around for the rest of your life. Linus yells after her. Well, what's it to you? Maybe I won't drag it around for the rest of my life. 
Then he thinks about it for a little bit in panel three. Then shouts out to his sister who has now left the room. Maybe I'll have it made into a sport coat. It's impossible to not do the read like this show, (laughs) (laughs) which I'm trying not to do, but it's almost impossible. People do tend to shout in the last panel, though. May 24th, 1964. In the first panel, we see the psychiatry stand. Psychiatric help, five cents. The doctor is way out. Charlie Brown, looking very upset, walks towards the stand saying, I hate feeling like this. He sits down. Lucy is there now. And he says to Lucy, I've come to you because lately I've... Lucy interrupts him. Wait a minute. Before you begin, I must ask that you pay in advance. Five cents, please. We see two panels of Charlie Brown fishing a nickel out of his pocket with his tongue out of his mouth, (laughs) putting it in the can. And then Lucy says, boy, what a sound. How I love to hear that old money plink, that beautiful sound of cold, hard cash, that beautiful, beautiful sound. Plink, plink, plink. What a beautiful sound. Plink, plink, plink. Nickels, nickels, nickels. That beautiful sound of beautiful plinking nickels. Then, (laughs) after this, Lucy puts her head on her hands and leans over the booth and says to Charlie Brown, All right, now what seems to be your trouble? Charlie Brown can only sigh. Siga. Siga. (laughs) Why does the sky keep changing colors? (laughs) Uh, Well, I was looking at this. I believe this is a recolor job because we're looking at classic peanuts. And also you can tell by the gradation in the sky from the blue to the light blue. But he was so, he just did that. He would just do that abstract color, you know, just color. And we we almost always are looking at black and white strips when we're discussing them on the podcast. But because we pulled these from actually the Peanuts wiki, because at the moment, Go Comics has been down for like four days. So I'm very concerned about Oh, no. That. Yeah. So good luck, Go Comics, whatever's going on there. Yeah. But, but this was something that Schultz did do a lot. Yeah. Um, what he'd use really uh, bold and changing colors from a yellow to a blue to a red in, in his Sunday strips. And, you know, having read a lot of these in black and white, you know, it was, it was the ones in real time, like in 1975 or whatever that I was reading. And I remember that that was very distinct part of, of peanuts was in, you know, Sunday Schultz would not hold a background color. He would, he would mix it up a lot. All right. If you had to vote now, you could only see the Sunday strips one way for the rest of your life, color or black and white. What are you voting, Michael? I got to go for black and white, but they were in color. They just, for some reason, they never reprinted them in color. Harold, how about you? Oh, that's tough. Uh, if I had, if I, if I could have one or the other, I guess I choose the black and white because when it comes to color, there was nothing about Schultz's color choices that, that, made me feel better about the strip or or like the strip more, I guess. So black and white, you just get to focus on the line art more, which I think is gorgeous. Yep. I would go black and white as well. Now look, look at that panel where he's putting the, that nickel into the can. Look at the perspective on, on that, the top of her sign. It's like going way up there. It's completely off. And it's the kind of thing that you wouldn't even necessarily notice. Unless it was white. colored, yeah, <laughs> yeah. Uh, the co- when uh, that is one of the the downsides of working in color is that you can't have those sort of soft. Well, you can, but you have to work a lot harder with the color. Uh, those soft edges where you're kind of not trying to have the eye go, uh, yeah. which is, is definitely what's happening there. Yeah. But but it's fine too. I, I'm not crazy about the coloring job on this i i'm not I, i'm curious as to how close it is to the original and no offense to whoever did it i mean yeah i'm guessing it's it's probably identical with the exception of of the computer you know the green on the tree seems they've tried to kind of sponge it a little bit so that it looks like yeah, it's three-dimensional and then you've got the slight gradation on the blue sky uh which for some reason just doesn't seem to work with the flat flatness of the characters and you know i i I deal with that with my own strip because i've got usually flat colors on my characters but the backgrounds can have a little gradation and it's hard it's hard to know you don't want to do something that looks so artificial like a computer did it yeah Um, but you also want to give a little bit of a variation and and so obviously somebody thought it was okay to to take the flat colors that schultz had and 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 just tweak it enough, but to the point that they tweak it so little, it it I, I don't know what the purpose is. It's neither I mean, here nor there, right? Yeah. Wow. Well. 
Well, I, I like coloring. I, th- I I always think I'll give up the coloring as part of my work, but then I realize it's so integral to what I'm doing. I kind of can't. Yeah, uh, I, in my sycophantic way, but I'm, I genuinely love the color that you do especially like when you have the outdoor scenes and you've got you've got little suns you know the the sunsets and the bursts your color is really really lovely and and you have the flatness of the characters certainly to start the the amelia rules uh the same flatness as peanuts because peanuts was you know obviously a model for you uh peanuts for the 21st century with amelia rules (laughs) you know you did find a way to take and I'm not sure what you did on the shading with the characters or you, how you mixed it up. I'm trying to rem- just from memory, but I remember the backgrounds being so rich, like the outdoor backgrounds. Yeah. And it doesn't detract at all. And I'm, are there any thoughts you have about how you approach that and why, like in, in something as flat as Schultz that you can get away with something that is, is as rich in the background as it is? Well, <sighs> Yeah, I, you know, because I, I think what it actually is, is that Schultz didn't have Schultz and everything that came after Schultz as an influence. One of the weird things, like I love Cerebus. I mean, Cerebus was and, and that's a tough thing to say these days because it's it's swamped in all kinds of political and, uh, you know, nonsense and controversies. But at the time, it was the funniest, most creative, coolest book before all that stuff engulfed it. And it had a really rich background world by this guy, Gerhard, who just did the backgrounds. And he's an artist, uh, a, a 3D pen and ink artist on like Robert Crumb or possibly beyond. Like he's as good as a human can do that. And I couldn't do that. But I figured, well, if I do have a digital tool, if I just drew Amelia's neighborhood as richly as possible in notebooks. And at the time, I actually would have had like, it was caught my, it was virtual Gerhard was my background, my folder on my Mac. And I had something like 50 different houses that I had drawn in me and I could paste them together in different ways and then draw over them to change them. And I could take the leaves off and do all this weird stuff so that when I'd have those really rich backgrounds, I didn't have to spend the time on the page. So you're really an animation so. artist in that regard, right? Right. Cause I, I mean, I, well, that's anymore, what you could, but yeah, that's how that was. Yeah. Because, I mean, I mean, for those of you who aren't that into animation or how it's done, I mean, what you had to do early on with most cartoons, if you were doing a color cartoon, is you could draw a beautiful, you could paint a beautiful background in acrylic or watercolor, and it could have as much detail as you wanted. But the characters were on these clear plastic sheets that you would take, you would trace the artwork from the pencil drawings of the actual animator with a, you know, usually with a black black ink pen by people who were experts in that and then they would wind up painting on the back of those cells and in most cases it was just a flat color because you know you, you couldn't afford to to shade shade that so so you know the backgrounds you you're just doing one for a whole sequence and you could really put a lot of lovely art into it and so i mean i i as a as a fan of animation, just got used to the idea that you have a flat character on a background that can be extremely rich. And that's, that's just normal. And I guess that's an aesthetic I, I inherited from watching all these old cartoons like Bugs Bunny and Disney films. And that's yeah. Right. And I loved all that too. Yeah. Here, I'll tell you, you mentioned the lighting and the, the, like you said, the suns in the sky. Yeah. And yeah. Sort of, okay. I'll tell you this story. This is, this is a, this is a, a tip. Because obviously all that stuff you could do with lens flares in Photoshop, right? You pull out this yeah. lens flare, that lens flare. Okay. I, w- I used to work, though, uh, in television, and I was always doing – I had to do graphics on a daily basis. And I was always looking for new things that I could use. And we obviously were a TV station, so we had weather. So I was trying to figure out how I could do different weather graphics. I was in the parking lot of the TV station, and – the sun was being reflected on a blacked out windshield from one of the TV vans, you know, and it was just this unbelievable lens flare on black glass. And uh, so I just took a photo of it (laughs) and suddenly, so I had like a beautiful lens flare that was not a digital one over black and I could move the black digitally. And then I thought, wow, why can't I do that? Every time I see just position a piece of black, (laughs) glass or and it was almost always that car different times of day and click there's a sunset click there's noon wow. click there's partly cloudy and i used that stuff for years and then you you know you manipulate digitally and put it in with the artwork and it and it works or He's it doesn't a genius. work but... 
<laughs> genius. That's basically what it is. Th- that I mean, that is pretty genius. I don't know. I've never heard of another artist having that mindset to to think to capture that. That's pretty cool. Oh well, thanks. Oh no. <laughs> I can't believe I have to read this strip twice. Uh, <laughs> all right. This is June 4th, 1961. Lucy, looking really annoyed, is sitting at his, her psychiatry booth. Linus comes up and sits down. She says to him, what in the world are you doing here? Linus says, I'm in sad shape. My life is full of fear and anxiety. The only thing that keeps me going is this blanket. I need help. Lucy suddenly invested, stands out from behind the booth and starts talking to Linus. Well, as they say on TV, the mere fact that you realize you need help indicates that you are not too far gone. I think we had better try to pinpoint your fears. If we can find out what it is you're afraid of, we can label it. Are you afraid of responsibility? If you are, then you have hypengeophobia. I don't think that's quite it. How about cats? If you're afraid of cats, you have ailerophobia. Well, sort of, but I'm not sure. Are you afraid of staircases? If you are, then you have climacophobia. Maybe you have thalassophobia. This is a fear of the ocean. Or jephorophobia, which is a fear of crossing bridges. Or maybe, says Lucy, you have pantophobia. Do you think you might have pantophobia? Linus says, what's pantophobia? Lucy says, the fear of everything. Linus yells, that's it! Perfect. Sending Lucy flying. Yeah. Boy, Sending she, Lucy flying. Does she fly in the cartoon? Does she flip over? And they, yes, yes, but it's Charlie Brown that um, is the patient, which I think is an improvement. And I think that's as interesting when we think about the specificity. I think we talked about this when we read the strip earlier, but the specificity of these characters seems so real to us. And yet it's fascinating that yeah. Schultz does reassign a character a major piece like this and and it works again on its own terms and that that i wouldn't expect i would have thought he would have stuck with his his characters but it it does yes. work i think better with 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 charlie brown and, and why linus when linus normally doesn't show up why did he think that linus needed to be the one to uh to well to say these things to Lucy. Well, the fact is Linus doesn't show it, but with the blanket, he's, it's a security blanket. He, he's deeply neurotic. I guess the blanket absorbs a lot right. of that. He usually doesn't show it that much. Right. Well, that's true because it's so, so effective, right? <laughs> but, but Charlie Brown, I mean, when Michael, you not having seen the special to, to hear the idea that Charlie Brown says almost exactly these same lines, does that seem wrong to you? Or does, can you kind of see how Charlie Brown himself also could say he has all, you know, fear? Uh, yeah, I think it sounds wrong to me because he's, I don't think he's afraid of things. Uh, he's just doesn't understand why everything goes wrong for him. Right. Cause he, he's always going up to swing again at something, right? He'll, he'll try a lot of things. He's afraid to talk to the little redhead girl. There's certain things that he, you know, the, we didn't think of Charlie Brown. That's just too much for him, but he is a, he is a trier, right? As a, in a lot of ways. That is true. Yeah. I would definitely not swap out those characters. September 18th, 1961. Lucy looks forlorn and a little annoyed. She has her elbows on the table and the remains of what looks like a pretty nice birthday party is scattered about the table. Linus looks on as Lucy says, Nobody gave me what I wanted for my birthday. Nobody. What sort of presents do you call these? She says as she looks over a whole mound of presents on the floor. New shoes, a green sweater, and a bunch of stupid toys. Linus says, well, What were you expecting? Lucy says, Real estate. So here, here Lucy's yelling again. Yeah. We said it again in the last panel. I think you got to scream the punchline. That's part of peanuts. <laughs> and, and yet, in, in, again, in the in the animated in animated piece, it's it's much more matter of fact how Lucy's speaking, and it, I, I think that works really well. But it's interesting that the choices that Schultz is making when he's going through these is it's almost like he thinks some of his best punchlines are the ones when his characters are are speaking the most loudly. I'm, I'm, I'm seeing a trend here. <laughs> huh. This one went over my head. I, I seem to remember puzzling what real estate was. 
<laughs> <laughs> right, right. As opposed to fake estate. Yeah. Yeah. As a little kid, I've scratched my head. You wouldn't want toys? <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> what? So strange. But And again, you were talking, Michael, about how, you know, when you hear a little kid stumbling over these lines and you you see the sophistication of what Schultz is writing, that it, it just feels alien and wrong. And, it you know, having been imprinted to it, I think what my mind has done with when I hear a child reading the, 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 the precision of Schultz's words is it, it, it's, it stands in such contrast that you're, you're made aware of the precision of Schultz's words, which I actually really enjoy. It's, right. it's, it's a strange thing. Right. November 18th, 1961. Linus is writing a letter to Santa Claus as Charlie Brown looks on. Linus writes, dear Santa Claus, Enclosed, please find list of things I want for Christmas. Also, please note indication of size, color, and quantity for each item listed. Then in panel three, Linus seals up the envelope, leaving Charlie Brown alone in panel four to say, how efficient can you get? Okay, I'm guessing that yeah, Linus actually spoke those words rather than us seeing him write, it, write them. It, well, what it is, is it's given to Sally. And Sally comes up to Charlie Brown and says, will you write a letter to Santa for me? And she dictates it mm, okay. uh, to him and, and delivers those lines. Okay. So, yes, it is that way. And how efficient can you get gets dropped. Right. Really? It's part of a longer sequence. Yes, of Charlie Brown becoming disillusioned by people and their greed at Christmas. Huh. Okay. And Charlie Brown then later finds out that you don't need to spend a lot of money. You can just buy a, or you just go out and get a, a, a grubby little tree, and that's all you need for the spirit of Christmas. You can now buy a plastic replica of that grubby <laughs> little tree. And what a coincidence. Strange. Huge coincidence that he found a Charlie Brown tree. <laughs> I know. What were the odds? Well, now, do you guys know? I'm sure we talked about this before, but I, that's what I used to do when I was a kid. Me and my dad would go out into the woods and find the grubbiest little pine oh. that would be growing out of the the cold dirt, basically, and take it home, put it in a coffee can, and decorate it with homemade ornaments. And that way, that was our Christmas oh. tradition. I actually wrote about this in uh, Boom Studios, did a book a few years ago celebrating the 65th anniversary. And you know what? I'm going to post it. I'll post it on uh, social media. I'll post it on our website so people can download it for Christmas. That was a great story. Why don't we do that? That'll be fun. That'd be cool. I, I, oh, thank you. That was the best story in the book. Oh, thanks, <laughs> Michael. Oh, now I got two Christmas presents already. This is the best <laughs> day ever. I have to confess that we we have uh, we not have have not one but two Charlie Brown Christmas trees from from CVS drugstore. <laughs> that I think we we and after a move we had lost the first one and so we got the second one and uh we put both of them up side by side they have been up all year uh <laughs> atop our baker's rack in our in our living room uh all decorated because we we just weren't going to touch it and so we've been celebrating a Charlie Brown Christmas all year round so and now to I just for clarity this is pure laziness this is not actual interest in charlie brown christmas 365 <laughs> just just being lazy it's one of life's great mysteries I, I, <laughs> we, i'm not gonna i'm not gonna parse that out <laughs> awesome okay december 20th 1962 now lucy's writing to santa claus she writes dear santa claus i know you are a busy man i don't want you to waste your time thinking about what toys i might like Make it easy on yourself. This year, just bring me money. Preferably 10s and 20s. <laughs> now, this is adapted into the same sequence uh, with Sally writing the letter. Hmm. Okay. Right. So it's this building on Charlie Brown as he's getting more and more disgusted as he's the secretary for Sally. Yeah. yeah. And then at the and end of it. 1961 strips. So you could see him <laughs> flipping through a reprint book or something. Yeah, and, and one of the most famous lines, at least for me, from the Christmas special is when Charlie Brown finally runs away in horror at hearing what his oh, little sister yes. is saying. And and he just basically like tosses the tosses the paper up in the air and runs away screaming. And then she just kind of turns to the camera and she goes, All I want is what's coming to me. All I want is my fair share. 
a classic moment. A classic. I've I have said that many, many, many times over the yeah, years. yeah. Me too. That's that's a household thing that comes up a lot in our in our day to day conversation. Speaking of, oh, there it is. November seventeenth, nineteen sixty one. Linus is posting a letter to Santa Claus with a great three line U.S. mailbox right there. Lucy looks on saying, are you sending those greedy letters to Santa Claus again? Linus says, I'm not greedy. And he turns to confront Lucy and says, all I want is what I have coming to me. All I want is my fair share. Lucy's outraged and says, Santa Claus doesn't owe you anything. Linus begs to differ. He does if I've been good. That's the agreement. Linus storms off saying, any 10th grade student of commercial law can tell you that. Lucy says, oh, good grief. Again, so the interchangeability of lines and characters is really, really interesting that, that Schultz, um, he transfers this to, what, what year did you say this was? 19, it's not, not too far back from when they make it, right? It is 1961. 61. Okay. So Sally isn't yet in a position to, to do this, but the fact that it's transferred to Sally, it's, it's, it's very true to Sally. I think because Sal, we haven't had a chance to talk a ton about Sally, the grown up Sally, but She's such an interesting character. She's she's certainly has a strong sense of self, right? And she knows what Very it is much. that she wants, and she sees the world differently than everyone else. And and she has this kind of uh, I don't know how you put it, but it's it's like it's not selfish, but it's a it it's she sees things through her own lens to, that serves her own purpose. And it, it seems like transferring that line, and then just and just letting it lie there. That that last all I want is what I have coming to me. All I want is my fair share, and there's 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 it's it's not a punchline. It just kind of hovers in the air because it is part of Charlie Brown's building apprehension about how everything seems to be wrong about you know the holiday season. It really works well. And I I will again say I I think this is an improvement. This this is a line. This isn't very Linusy to me. I mean, it is Linus as he's done it, and Linus is a rich character who can do all these various things. I what I mean by that though is I think it's more effective when it's given to Sally. Yeah, it's it's chilling actually when she says it. I mean, there's something about it that is chilling. Sally, because the thing that Sally Sally actually sees through a lot of the BS, a lot of the baloney of the world. You know. And she's like, no, this is the deal. All I want is what's co- like, what, what's the problem? <laughs> yeah, she's not talking about lawyers here. She's just this is you know, right. This is the way. This is the way it, it is. And and that's you know we have to kind of absorb the fact that this is the way it is. I mean, she's she's speaking with the, probably the most innocent voice at this point in the the strip or in the special, and yet this is the conclusion she's come to. And how do you argue with it? Exactly. March 27th, 1960. Charlie Brown has the whole gang over. Looks like it's a rainy Sunday. Uh, We see Schroeder, Patty, Lucy, Linus, Violet, Pigpen, Shermie, and Snoopy all coming into Charlie Brown's house. Charlie Brown, decked out in his baseball cap, greets them. Hi, Snoopy. Hi, Shermie. Glad you made it. Hi, Pigpen. Hi, Violet. How's the world's prettiest third base? Third base? Wow. Well, no wonder you lose, Charlie Brown. Hi, Linus. Hi, Lucy. And by the way, calling her pretty. Wow, Charlie Brown. Yeah, what's going on? This is weird. Hi, Patty. Hi, Schroeder. How's the old throwing arm? Charlie Brown addresses his team. He says, well, it's real good seeing you all here ready to begin the new baseball season. Due to the rain today, we will follow the inclement weather schedule. This means studying our signals. Now, a good baseball team functions on the knowledge of its signals. This year, we will try to keep them simple. If I touch my cap like this, it means for whoever happens to be on base to try to steal. If I clap in my hands, it means the batter is to hit straight away. But if I put them on my hips, then he or she is to bunt. If I walk up and down in the coaching box, it means for the batter to wait out the pitcher. In other words, to try for a walk. But now, after all is said and done, it must be admitted that signals alone never won a ball game. It's the spirit of the team that counts. The interest that the players show in their team. Am I right? I said, am I right? A beat panel. And then we see Charlie Brown was basically talking to no one as the whole team is now watching television instead. And he just says to himself, you're right. And sighs. How is this a Christmas strip? This is an odd choice. It it is an odd choice. Now, yeah, it's it's completely. And a very clever choice. Very clever. Because what Charlie Brown is doing in this special is directing the Christmas pageant. 
and he has to deliver a speech like this basically to the whole group. So he does a version of this. Yeah, so let's set this up. So Lucy has decided uh, after a psychiatric session that Charlie Brown needs involvement. And so he should be involved in the Christmas pageant. So she deems that he should be the director of the Christmas pageant. So Charlie Brown is taking this on as it's, it's a, it's a real honor. Like I get to direct the Christmas pageant It's kind of like the baseball manager thing. And so he, here he is all starry eyed that he's going to get to inspire a group of people as a director. And he goes through this speech with very few changes just saying, you know, I, I, as your director, I'll give you a motion that you should speed this up, slow this down, you know, that sort of thing in the play and nobody's listening in it. And everyone is dancing to, <laughs> to, uh, Linus and Lucy being played by Schroeder. So yeah, yeah it, it's such a, it, it's, this is fascinating that he, instead of writing something fresh, some Schultz remembers this baseball thing and, and converts it so that he's, he's adapting his own work for a different purpose rather than writing something fresh. And, you know, he, I, what kind of encyclopedic memory he had of his own strip, I don't mm. know. And, you know, and, but again, it comes back to this non-preciousness, like going, all right, I'll take this and I'll, you know, strip it down for, use it for parts, basically. Right. Well, yeah. That's exactly what it feels yeah. like. The gag does not, and there's also the gag kind of does a, not work. It, sorry to say. As a strip? Well, yeah. I mean, it's clearly, how can he not see that they've left? <laughs> He's looking at him. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's, I think, why it, it really works better in the animated uh, special, right? Because it's predicated on the music, you know? And he, Charlie Brown's like giving this speech, and but the music then just builds up and bursts and suddenly everyone's dancing. Uh, that does work, I think, better than yeah. they're just off watching TV three feet away from them. Yeah. Well, there's something uh, also very d disturbing here. What's that? They thought Patty was blonde. Why does she have red hair? They change that coloring throughout. Uh, it's sometimes she's blonde. Sometimes she's a brunette. Sometimes she's almost not redhead, but it's like an auburn. Yeah, I, I always my version of Patty was always a brunette. She's a brunette in the special. But when I went back and saw the original coloring, she was definitely a blonde. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I don't know who or why that changed, but it changed in the strip, too. Who knows? Oh, this is OK. This is an off question. But William Pepper, our uh, our beloved pal and a fellow podcaster, had a weird question, Harold. In uh, Charlie Brown, the anniversary book, the 25th, the Jubilee, the color illustrations are described as plates, plate, like plate one, plate 25. Do you have any idea why that would be? You know, I, I do have a little bit of insight into that. So I don't. And I don't know if whose choice that was. That sounds like a graphic blandishment kind of thing on Schultz's yeah. part. But it used to be when you printed a book on a press, if is you it because they a, used to be tipped in? Exactly, because you you yep. would print everything in black and white or two color, and then if you had full color, it would often be printed on like a nice glossy thick paper, and it would have to be inserted between wherever a signature break was, like if you have a sixteen or thirty two page giant sheet of paper folded down into that size yeah, that was all black and white and then you drop in a, a plate and maybe there's only one side that it's printed on because the press could only muster four colors on one side and a specialty press back when color was so expensive and so those would be called plates because yeah they were they were tipped in sheets that were printed separately in color Got it. so that's it. we're a full service podcast though I don't think that works in the in that that book because I, I think they had to run that whole book through a four color press, the, the 25th anniversary book. So the concept of a plate is is a little bit archaic. And I wouldn't be at all surprised if that was something that Schultz used because he was such an avid reader and loved books. And so he wanted to have his things called plates. That's my guess. And the thing I'd like to mention on this strip is we see Shermie leading the pack into Charlie Brown's house in this baseball strip where Charlie Brown goes on talking about the directions for how to be the, a good team. And Shermie becomes almost an, a, an in joke in the, in the Christmas special. I don't think it's from the strip itself when they're handing out the parts for the Christmas special. Right. Um, was it Lucy's handing them out? Yes. And Shermie gets the part of, of a shepherd. 
And uh, do you remember the actual line he says, uh, Jim? Every year it's the same thing. I always end up being a shepherd, something like that. Yeah. And it's like, oh, that's that's just so sure me by 1965. <laughs> Hey, my very first Christmas pageant, first grade, I was the third wise man. I was on stage for about 45 seconds. I said, what was my line? These are the gifts we have brought to this holy child. (laughs) I was a lost boy in Peter Pan in fourth grade. Uh, (laughs) Oh, and I was also uh, Governor Clinton. I don't know if I mentioned this before. And when I was in Fairport, New York. Uh, we had the little pageant of the, you know, the founding of Fairport, New York. And I was Governor Clinton visiting the, this new little town that had just been started. And I remember my, I still have this memory. My sister was, was, was feeding me the lines, you know, so I would remember it just like Lucy and Linus <laughs> are doing it. So I totally, totally relate to him having to memorize stuff for the Christmas pageant because I remembered this. And um, I remember my sister, she got into it. And so she was like way overdoing her setup lines for me. Mm-hmm. So she was supposed to be saying evening governor and she was going evening governor. <laughs> <laughs> you know? And I, and I was supposed to come in and go, my, what a fair port. And there was a, that's it. We're going to call the town Fairport. <laughs> and, and boy, that never forgotten that. Well, while we're reminiscing, I I put the call out on social media and on my Twitter. If anybody had any um, any thoughts about peanuts at Christmas and uh, we got a couple hits, Liz and Eric from uh, from PA, actually, my my home state said they have uh, peanuts cutouts that they put on their lawn every year. Life size peanuts cutouts standing around the Christmas tree. So that is one way. Uh, oh, uh, Shaylee Robson uh, from Canada, our super listener. She wrote and said that she likes to draw Charlie Brown and Snoopy on her uh, Christmas card for her grandpa every year. So that's very nice. And if you guys are out there and you're thinking, hey, I want to I want to start a new Christmas tradition or do something nice. One thing that we'd love is if you, uh, you know, while you're while you're spending some holiday bucks and buying people presents, maybe swing by Unpacking Peanuts. Uh, you can check out our store. You can buy our new Unpacking Peanuts t-shirts, which I'm really happy with. We have a, an Abbey Road style one, and we, we have the logo of the three of us at the thinking wall. And in case you're wondering, it's left to right, Michael, me, then Harold. We have a, a Patreon uh, where you could you can sign up and you can sponsor us month by month, or you can uh, also just buy us a mud pie uh, through our website. All we want is what's coming to us. All we want is our fair share. <laughs> <laughs> well done. February 19th, 1965. Snoopy is sitting atop his doghouse, thinking to himself, I feel strange. In panel two, he jumps off the doghouse. Then he's sitting there with a grin on his face, and he thinks to himself, I feel very loving today. I think I'll kiss somebody on the cheek. He walks up to Lucy, who's sitting outside reading a book, and kisses her on the cheek with his lips. Smack. She screams to the heavens, Og, somebody get me some soap and water. I've just been kissed by a dog. Snoopy goes flying. She's running around ranting now. Get hot water. Get some disinfectant. Get some iodine. In the next to last panel, Snoopy looks a little nonplussed himself, saying, Good grief. And he goes back to lying in the doghouse, thinking, Next time I'll bite her on the leg. So you're saying Snoopy's thoughts are not heard in the special no he's completely pantomime with some little like vocalizations done by melendez just like ah and, oh. so there's no uh, punchline on this well right so you basically have you just have the the, the interaction between snoopy and lucy which at this point is a, is a fight right they get into a fight yeah and well, uh yeah, yeah am yeah, i yeah, getting that right, right. Yeah, yeah and then and so she's running all over the place overreacting snoopy's just kind of sitting there and then they do a zoom in on snoopy and he just goes (laughs) (laughs) it's very cute so a different a different approach but it it is actually quite funny the way it's done now they do manage to make it work for animation i think i i I, again you know with his kind of uh very practical eye saying how can we do this so that it'll work in this medium and you know more often than not it sure does work and one of the best, if if I'm not mistaken, and someone listening, if that, if I'm wrong, please correct me. Let us know. Get on the you know 
sent us a message or whatever. But I believe I heard someone say that a lot of the Snoopy stuff was animated by a guy named Bill Littlejohn, who had been involved in animation for years and years. He was a real master and he, he had really nice flowing uh, movement and animation. And as hard as the kids are to animate in this kind of two dimensional, you know, big head style, short arms. Snoopy is kind of a dream to animate because Schultz has stretched him every which way. And people kind of expect that as Snoopy. So he's very, very kind of rubbery animation character. And there are a lot of opportunities for Snoopy. He does his joyous, happy dance on Schroeder's piano, uh, getting into the raptured by the music. And uh, there's just a lot of lovely stuff at the opening. Uh, they have they're on a pond, and Snoopy is is ice skating on his feet, and just beautiful sweeping arcs. And you know that that's I understand is Bill Littlejohn's yeah. animation. It's probably one of the best animators that Bill Melendez ever had on his staff. And he's a damn good archer. And, uh, sidekick yeah, to Robin. Damn, Hood. I beat you by like two seconds. <laughs> <laughs> January fifth, nineteen sixty four. Linus is watching television. Lucy comes up saying, switch channels. Linus ignores her. Lucy is annoyed. She says to him again, I said, switch channels. I want to watch my program. Linus turns around and says, are you kidding? What makes you think you can just walk right in here and take over? Lucy presents her fist to Linus saying, these five fingers. Individually, they're nothing. But when I curl them together like this into a single unit, they form a weapon that is terrible to behold. Which channel do you want, says Linus. Lucy sits down. Linus sighs. Then Linus looks at his own hand, thinking, why can't you guys get organized like that? <laughs> Panel five is like Stan Lee dialogue. Oh, it really is. <laughs> That's so funny. <laughs> do, you think, do, do you think Schultz was still buying comics and reading Stan Lee? I think it's entirely possible. <laughs> no, what year was this? Oh, yeah, there was 64. Yeah, could have been. Uh, it's really funny when you look at it like that. Oh, Melendez must have liked this as a as a union guy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and it, they they really do shorten this for the yes. the, the the gag is different. And again, in the special, where um, I think she says it, he, he's, he's like, was it give give me a reason oh, or whatever? He says he, he says give me one good reason why yeah. I should memorize these lines, and she says I'll give you five good reasons. One, two, three, four, five. And as she does, she curls each one of her fingers into a fist. And, a and then classic, Linus says, <laughs> go ahead. And classic Linus line, goes, those are good reasons. <laughs> December 17th, 1961. We see Linus as a candle <laughs> in a wreath in a decorative <laughs> opening panel. His head is the flame. Then we cut to their living room. It's Linus and Lucy. And Linus says, oh, no, don't tell me. Not again. Lucy walks up holding a piece of paper, presents it to Linus and says, here's your piece for the Christmas program. Linus reads it. So the words spoken through Jeremiah the prophet were fulfilled. A voice was heard in Rama, wailing and loud laments. It was Rachel weeping for her children and refusing all consolation because they were no more. Good grief. <laughs> Lucy walks away. Uh, Linus looks after her. Lucy says, memorize it and be ready to recite it by next Sunday. Linus yells after Lucy. I can't memorize something like this in a week. This is going to take research. Linus continues. Who was Jeremiah? Where was Rama? Why was Rachel so upset? He follows Lucy saying, you can't recite something until you know the who, the where, and the why. Lucy looks at Linus and says, I'll tell you the who, the where, and the why. You start memorizing right now, or you'll know who is going to slug you, and you'll know where she's going to slug you, and you'll know why she slugged you. Linus says, looking very upset, Christmas is not only getting too commercial, it's getting too dangerous. A classic line. I Listen, I have to say, I have a lot of sympathy for Lucy's management style. I, I see <laughs> nothing wrong with this at all. <laughs> Other thoughts, counterpoints? <laughs> I've, I've been on the wrong side of your, your five fingers. <laughs> <laughs> now, not literally. not literally. Pretty much. <laughs> Makes sense. You know what? People don't like conflict, as Tina Fey says, but it gets stuff done. <laughs> But it is it is so funny that he's writing this here and it's in the 60s, early 60s, but not the year this was done. And to Michael's point, 
you know, you have these kids reading these lines and they don't know what they mean. And here's Linus complaining about that very thing. So I, I need to know what I'm saying and why I'm saying it. And in, in these animated specials, the kids are, I guess, reading this pretty cold and they, they don't know necessarily what the meaning is of everything that they're saying. So that's a, it's interesting that he's got it in this strip that Linus is complaining about that concept that he's asked to say something without understanding it. Mm-hmm. November 26th, 1959. Patty and Charlie Brown are viewing pig pen. Who's just sitting there minding his own business. Charlie Brown says, did it ever occur to you that pig pen might be carrying the dirt and dust of some past civilization? They come in closer to scrutinize pig pen who just looks baffled by the whole thing. (laughs) Charlie Brown says, notice how the dust clings to him. Then Patty and Charlie Brown walk away. As Charlie Brown says, he could have on him some of the soil of ancient Babylon. Pigpen yells after them. Sort of makes you want to treat me with more respect, doesn't it? (laughs) Great Pigpen line. It's good because really Charlie Brown will, Pigpen's the only one Charlie Brown can actually mock. He gets mocked all the time, but he has a... Well, is he mocking him? Oh, yeah. You think? I think. I, I think they're just legitimately thinking these things. I don't know. And I will say in the in the Christmas special, when you did get to hear the nuance of it, it it's set up that Charlie Brown is, is quite sincere as the director of this play. He, may, maybe you could say he's, as the director of the play, is saying something that's ever going to serve him as the director, but... He is giving Pigpen the honor of this versus it being something that he's poking fun at him for. Well, it's also, though, significantly rewritten in the special. So there is this this very conversation could have happened in between, you know, between, say, Mendelssohn, Melendez and Schultz. Uh, What is this? What is this joke? And, And it's been rewritten to clarify that it's really there to give Pigpen the opportunity to say, hey, see, I do deserve some respect. It is much clearer when you see it animated than it is here. And I'm sure I saw it animated before I read it here. So I would never be able to even view it with Michael's eyes. Right. Right. Yeah. It's coloring the way we, we see this line. And, and, you know, Schultz, we heard that Schultz really couldn't stand bullying. And it seems like with Charlie Brown, after we get into so many years into the strip, Schultz couldn't bear for him to, have a line that would be sarcastic about somebody else. It's like somehow Charlie Brown was to embody that, you know, that, that he, he's, he's been so put upon himself that he's not going to do it himself. So I'm looking at, it, I think for the, through that lens as well, but it almost looks here like Schultz is, is leaving it to go either way mm-hmm. because the, just the look that's on the characters, you've got a kind of an innocent smile on, on Patty there with Charlie Brown. Patty is known for being kind of snarky herself. It's interesting that it's Patty uh, or maybe it's because Schultz wanted somebody who you didn't think too much about what she's thinking. Cause you're not, you don't know her as well as Lucy or, or Linus or whatever. But anyway, yeah, I, I could see how you could read it either way. Well, that's is a genius thing that Schultz says. And we've talked about this many times over all the episodes where you can look at it both ways and it's funny both ways. Very strange. And and really special and unique to Peanuts. And I don't think there's that much like nuance in Beetle Bailey. Like, <laughs> did Sarge really mean to stomp on Beetle Bailey? You know what I mean? There, there yeah. is the way the combination of the subjects he's writing and the way he draws them leaves a little room for a, a significant amount of room for the reader to put themselves, which is really great. Yeah, and Michael in the in the Christmas special, it's Frida complaining that that all of the dust is going to ruin her naturally curly hair. Oh. So he he again mixes up our characters in the special. We really see the difference in how Pigpen is drawn in uh when we look at these next this next strip in sequence because we're going back in time and we see January 7th, 1956. And we see uh, a very different looking um, earlier version of Pigpen standing outside as Violet approaches holding a mirror. And she says, Pigpen, you're an absolute mess. Here, I want you to look at yourself in this mirror, she says, presenting him the mirror. Pigpen does so. And Violet says, now, aren't you ashamed? And Pigpen says, like a boss, on the contrary, I didn't think I looked that good. I have stolen this line uh, for my life in many, many different times. I have too. Yeah. 
and uh, Je- Jeff Ornstein was the voice of the first pig pen, and he, I think he just nails it. It's got this this sense of detached self confidence. It's not not superiority, even though he kind of has this haughty look on his face, but it's he's just like he's standing up for himself on the highest level. <laughs> um, and it's yes. it's so funny. Okay, I skipped. Uh, there's a big sequence uh, that we're not going to cut. A few sequence of 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 Sally and Linus. Uh, it's sort of tangentially in the special. It's not exactly the way it is, though. So we're going to skip okay. those, and we're going to go to February nineteenth, nineteen sixty two. Lucy leans over to Charlie Brown and says, "Do you think I'm beautiful, Charlie Brown?" In panel two, Lucy says, "You didn't answer right away. You had to think about it, didn't you?" Lucy continues, if you had really thought I was beautiful, you would have spoken right up. Lucy's now ranting. I know when I've been insulted. I know when. Charlie Brown says, good grief. Oh, and this this animates and, and with the voice of, of just beautifully. Again, a, a, one of those classic lines. And yeah, it, it certainly in day-to-day conversation, these lines come up so often in our household. December 5th and 6th of 1963 is where we get the famous, we all know that Christmas is a big commercial racket. It's run by a big Eastern syndicate, you know. You know all about big Eastern syndicates if you've heard our 1959 episode where Harold explains that in depth. And if you haven't, you got to go listen to it. Give yourself a Christmas present. Listen to that one. And I think that's one that Peter Robbins, the first voice of, of Charlie Brown, said that was one of the lines that he remembered mystified him. <laughs> when, he, when it was being read it's like what on earth are we talking about here i always thought it was like an organized crime reference which i guess it kind of is anyway forget it <laughs> yeah well that's that's the thing it's only weird comics people that would think of syndicates as <laughs> as newspaper syndicates but right. as a little kid i yeah. i was always well there that. goes your shot at having a syndicated <laughs> ship Jimmy. i think that that <laughs> ship had sailed <laughs> July 28th, 1963. Lucy is hanging out at Schroeder's piano. Schroeder's practicing, and Lucy says, Beethoven, ha, everybody talks about how great Beethoven was. Beethoven wasn't so great. This gets Schroeder's attention. What do you mean Beethoven wasn't so great? Lucy says, he never got his picture on bubblegum cards, did he? Have you ever seen his picture on bubblegum cards, huh? Schroeder walks away. He's so upset by this. Lucy continues. How can you say someone is great who's never had his picture on bubblegum cards? That's what I mean when I say Beethoven wasn't so great, she says, yelling after Schroeder, who's left. Then she leans back on the piano, very satisfied, a smile on her face. And she says, this has been a good day. She's a troll. Yeah, right. (laughs) She's Totally. totally pressing his buttons. As we know, because she doesn't even want her Joe Schlobotnik bubblegum card when she's right. Charlie Brown's begging her for it. So she has no she has no stock in, in bubblegum cards. So how does this how how does this joke changed uh, in the Christmas special, Jimmy? And, and do you think it's better in the strip or do you think it's better in the special? I actually think it's a wash. I think it works both ways pretty well although i there is something really special about this last drawing of lucy looking so (laughs) self-satisfied i kind of missed that (laughs) but yeah i'm gonna i'm gonna i'm gonna say both and what's out i like them both ways (laughs) yeah me too then we move on and we have uh snoopy on on december 30th 1956 we have uh snoopy dancing on top of schroeder's piano which is brilliantly and beautifully animated as harold discussed earlier then we have December 24th, 1964. Linus is decked out in shepherd's gear on a stage in front of a red curtain. Snoopy's by his side, just lying on his stomach, kind of looking asleep. Linus says the famous line, and there were in the same country shepherds abiding in the field, keeping watch over their flock by night. Then Linus, <laughs> out of the corner of his mouth, whispers to Snoopy, Psst, flock. Snoopy wakes up and says, Bah goes back to sleep and of course while not exactly how it plays out in the episode the episode does feature as its climax if not its conclusion linus uh reciting the gospel of saint luke which of course was a a very surprising and controversial take at the time but schultz does it in a way that is 
well, he has Linus. This is Linus's stuff. This is the stuff Linus thinks about and talks about, and it's natural to his character. Linus doesn't proselytize anything about it. Charlie Brown asks a question, what's Christmas about? And Linus says that. Yeah, and B- Bill Mel- Bill Melendez, he said when Schultz first brought it up in their very first meeting, as you might expect, he said, we can't do that. It's too religious. And and he, he said, Schultz's reply was, Bill, if we don't do it, who else can? We're the only ones who can do it. Essentially, he says, we're the only ones who can do it. But when you think about Schultz's 15 years in the in the public eye and all of the choices that he made, and again, that, that personal integrity of that, you know, if this is what Schultz wants to say, we kind of want him to say it, right? And and I think that's because he somehow managed to um, to share who he was, and you just kind of wanted to know what Schultz had to say. And and it, it, it doesn't feel like it's tacked on, or it doesn't feel like it's artificial or forced. An artist at this level has to be allowed to say what they want to say. And, you know, like at, at the thousands of these comic strips and reaching out to millions and millions and millions of people, you know, he has earned the right and the trust that he's not going to blow up the property with some crazy thing. You know, he's going to do it with the class and integrity. He does everything else. And that's exactly what he did. And it really works. And and I think, you know, I don't know when he says, Bill, if we don't do it, who else can? But I, I think if he had said, if, if, if I can't do it, who else can? I think there's a lot of truth to that because he 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 earned 15 yeah. years into his career the right to have that little one minute in his Christmas special, and that's what he said from the very beginning. This he wanted the Christmas special to be, and and you look at the arc of the special about you know being too commercial, and then it ends with the Christmas tree. In some ways, it's got a, its own kind of almost dreamlike <laughs> flow. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's that's the thing about this special that is has fascinated me from from childhood, and in a way, I feel like you know I've been thinking and asking myself why is this special to me the greatest half hour of television? You know, the desert island thing. If I could save one half hour of television, this is it. Why is that? What is it about this special that that gets this loyalty from me? And, and this is very personal for me. This is just my my perspective but i think in my life i've grown into this christmas special if that makes any sense you know every every flaw and every idiosyncrasy is a, is a delight and mm-hmm. I, you know i can't think of a whole, well there are things like that that i can say that i also feel the same way i mean working on mystery science theater if anybody's ever seen that show joel hodson was the original host and he was often you know kind of down on himself of, of flubbing his lines or you know they're, they're shooting with one camera you can't fake the editing and so he would give he would give himself these impossible things to perform. They were like three minutes long, a song while he's beating a lemur puppet on his on these <laughs> on these characters around him. And it's 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 like watching somebody on a on a roller coaster or or just doing an acrobatic stunt and he's stumbling and he's almost falling off the rails and it's absolutely delightful. Well, I think there's something to that in this special that, you know what it is and how humble it is as a special and how, you know, limited it is in its animation. And it has all of these flaws that they didn't have time to fix. And yet every flaw somehow is delightful. It's like, it's part of the special. It's part of what the specials is and what it says. It, and I, you know, I, I marvel at it just like I marvel at Schultz's strips that this wasn't just Schultz. This was a whole team of people getting behind mm-hmm. Schultz. And, you know, my personal experience is that I went from a shy fearful teenager in high school, you know, talking about Linus and Charlie Brown saying, you know, they fear of everything. You know, I was, I, I can relate to that as a, as a kid. And, you know, I was in high school and college. That's the way I was until all heaven broke loose, you know, that in my life. And I'm, and I was confronted with this, this God who I, I no longer thought was non-existent or distant or a cosmic jerk but this sweet, lovely person, gentle and humble in heart, absolutely delightful. And I can't imagine a God better than that one that I'm discovering. And it totally fits this little moment at the end of a Charlie Brown Christmas. I think that's why I relate to it so much is that you got this sweet little lisping six-year-old cartoon character telling of the savior being born in a cattle trough. And that all I can say is yes. Yeah. 
Well, that's, well, thank you for sharing that. I would quickly like to say that I, for just before we get too far into the philosophy of it all, Cosmic Jerk, new band name, I called it. But <laughs> uh, <laughs> no, I, I know what you're saying. I had a very different experience growing up. I went to Catholic school and, and you know, so religion was always part of my life. But uh, th- this so this is this will tell you what you need to know about me. This probably is my favorite TV special or TV half hour of all time. My other, my favorite movie, my favorite grown up movie is uh, <laughs> Once Upon a Time in Hollywood by Quentin Tarantino. <laughs> and there are two moments in art. Uh, one is when Linus comes out and says, Lights, please, and recites the Gospel of St. Luke. And the other is when Brad Pitt is smashing the hippie uh, murderer's head <laughs> into the fireplace. When I sit there, experience this art, I think, you know what? everything's going to be all right. <laughs> Those are the two moments. Uh, everything's going to be all right. And I'm so grateful uh, that Mr. Schultz made the art that makes the world all right, at least while you're experiencing it. And I am beyond grateful that I get to experience it every week with you guys to my best friends in the world, my other wonderful beloved friend, Liz, And all of you listeners out there who are tuning in every week in greater and greater numbers, not for us, but because we love Peanuts and we love Charles Schultz. So that's it for us right now. Please review us. Please visit our website. You can check us out on Patreon. Uh, We're at Unpack Peanuts on both Instagram and Twitter. if They're both still things when this posts. So please do all that. But otherwise, whatever you're celebrating, have it be wonderful and and filled with love and happiness and have a great beginning of the new year. Harold, uh, to you, Merry Christmas, my friend. Michael and Liz, happy St. Dagobert's Day. Thank you. And to the rest of you out there, be of good cheer. <laughs> yes, yes, be, be of, of good, good cheer. cheer. Unpacking Peanuts is copyright Jimmy Gownley, Michael Cohen, and Harold Buckholtz. Produced and edited by Liz Sumner. Music by Michael Cohen. Additional voiceover by Aziza Shakrala Clark. For more from the show, follow Unpack Peanuts on Instagram and Threads, Unpacking Peanuts on Facebook, Blue Sky, and YouTube. For more about Jimmy, Michael, and Harold, visit unpackingpeanuts.com. Have a wonderful day, and thanks for listening. <laughs>